This week, we're in the middle of a series called, Are You Still There? Are you still there? And the idea behind this series is taking a look at those seasons in our life where we just honestly wonder, God, are you still there? Are you still with us? There are times in our life when life gets crazy and tumultuous and it feels like there's no way out of our our situations and we wonder, where is God then? Or where do we find God when we're caught in the land between where we were and where we want to be? Where do we find God? God then? Or how about those times when we're simply in the waiting? When it feels like we've been in the waiting for weeks, months, years, or maybe even decades, where is God then? What do we do? How do we move forward? And what can we learn about ourselves and about God in these different seasons of life? We've talked about God in the waiting. We've talked about God in the valleys of life. We've talked about God in the land between. And this morning, I want us to talk about God in the storms of life. Dun, dun, dun. God in the storms of life. The storms of life are something that we honestly don't really like talking about. But the reality is, is that when it comes to storms, we'll all have them. And if you're one of those really rare people that you have not experienced a storm in your life, I just, I say this with all the love and compassion in my heart for you, but a storm is a coming, friend. (laughs) A storm is a coming because you cannot live through this life, rainbows and unicorns and butterflies all of the time. We live in a broken world. Life is messy. People are messy. We live in a world of brokenness, of things like disease, betrayal, abuse, financial ruin, health crises, and so many things. So many potential storms that we might face in our life. And I know that many are in this room today that are experiencing a storm right now. Right now, you might be in the middle of a financial storm, of a health storm, of a family storm, of a relational storm. You find yourself right in the thick of it, and you feel like, why is this happening to me? I I follow Jesus. Why is this happening to me? You, You read stories about things that you're going through about other people, but you never thought it would happen to you. And so you're thinking, Where is God in this? Where is his peace in this? Why do I feel so out of control? Well, this morning, I want us to address some of those concerns. But before I do, I want to say a few things about the storm. In life, you will experience storms. Storms will come. In scripture, Jesus says it himself. In John 16, he says, in this world, you will have trouble. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Jesus cautions us to know that eventually in life we'll experience a storm. Sometimes we think, well, I'm following Jesus, and I'm doing what Jesus has told me to do, and I'm a good Christian, and so that should give me like a free pass from all of the chaos of life. No, friend, Jesus even says it himself, you will have trouble. It doesn't matter if you're following Jesus or not, you will have trouble in this life. And sometimes the storms of life, they're so random. They're so random. They just come out of nowhere. All of a sudden, they just hit us like a semi-truck. But other times, the storms in life that we experience, they're kind of expected. They're expected storms. They're We know that maybe we've been engaging in some activities or some things that were maybe not so good for us. And we had just kind of hoped in the back of our mind that we wouldn't end up in a storm. But when the storm hits, we kind of knew it was coming. Or maybe it's that there's somebody in your family, somebody in your family who you, you've tried to talk to, you've tried to have that conversation with, you've tried to tell them the road that they're on is leading to nothing good. And at the end of the day, you can't want healing more than them. They have to want it too, and they didn't want it, and it resulted in a storm for you and your family. Other times we experience storms right in the middle of doing the will of God. Right in the middle of doing what God has called us to do. These are the most frustrating storms, honestly, to me. They're the most frustrating storms because you're like, God, 
I was Pastor Jackson to be obedient, and I was obedient. I served. I gave. I gave of myself. I gave of my time. God, I'm following you. I'm doing your will. I'm experiencing your blessing. I'm experiencing your goodness. And then all of a sudden, a storm hits. And the storms of life can be totally like that, just right in the middle of all the goodness, right in the middle of all the great things that God has for you, you can be swept up in a storm of life. While the storms of life certainly are not fun, they can teach us a lot. They can teach us a lot about ourselves. They can teach us a lot about God. They can teach us so much about life. And this morning, I want us to look at a story in the Bible, the story of Paul, when he uh, gets caught up in a storm and he gets shipwrecked and see what we can learn about Paul's story, from Paul's story of Paul being in the storm. Now, before we get to it, let's talk a little bit about who Paul is. Paul, at this point in Acts chapter 27, he's a prisoner. And Paul is a prisoner because he continues to preach about who Jesus is and what Jesus has done in his life. And so at this point in Acts 27, Paul finds himself in a little bit of legal trouble because he shared the good news about Jesus. Paul, he was the guy who wrote most of the New Testament that we have today. He was also a missionary. He went around planting churches. He, he went around developing leaders and pouring into other people and just sharing about who Jesus is, what Jesus did in his life, and what he can do in other people's lives as well. He took every opportunity, even as a prisoner, to share about the good news of Jesus. And when we find Paul in Acts chapter 27, he's actually a prisoner in that moment. He's a prisoner on his way to Italy. He's on his way to Rome to plea his case because people have brought charges against him, and he wants to plea his case so he doesn't get the death sentence. Spoiler alert, he does wind up getting to Rome, and eventually he preaches the good news about Jesus there as well. And I don't want us to read the entire chapter because it's like 45 verses and it would take way too long. So I'm just going to summarize the story for us. And then we'll take kind of a deep dive into a couple of points and a couple of things that we can learn about the storm. Sound good? All right. So Paul, he's making his way from the Mediterranean Sea over to Rome. So think about a map in your mind. See Greece and Turkey. That's where Paul is. That's where he's kind of started his journey. He's going to go down and around, and he's going to get to Rome. He's a prisoner on a boat, and he winds up getting transferred from one boat to another. Well, this new boat that he's on, it, it just, it's, it's struggling. It's the struggle bus of boats, all right? They are really trying to make some headway, but they experience some different winds, some different things, and essentially the journey just took a lot longer than they expected. And they wind up on this Greek island, and at this point, it's late September. And Paul, like I said, he was a missionary. So he had actually traveled this area quite a bit. He was familiar with the seas, and he was familiar with the seasons. And so even though he was a prisoner on the boat, having some familiarity with the area and with the season that they were in, he cautioned the ship's captain to stay where they were, to stay where they were because during the months of September and November, it was extremely difficult to travel by sea in this area. It was prone to a lot of storms, and especially since you have to realize, sometimes when we imagine Bible stories, we imagine them really clean and nice. Um, but you have to realize Paul is not on a cruise ship, right? There is no GPS. There is no call signal. There is no tracking device. Uh, the ship doesn't even have a rudder that he is on. The ship only probably has one sail, and it's probably just made out of some flimsy linen. This was not the time to try to be like, onward, man, we will brave the storm. No, this is not the time for that kind of bravery. This is the time to stay and wait. And so Paul speaks up. And eventually what we realize is the ship's captain, he doesn't listen to Paul, and the chaos kind of ensues from there. 
As they begin to make their way to the next island that they're going to stay at, the ship gets slammed with a huge storm. The storm was so intense, the crew members were literally trying to use ropes just to hold the boat together. They were actually taking cargo and anything they could get rid of and throwing it off the ship just to stay afloat. There were some men on the ship that even decided they were going to pretend to throw an anchor over the ship to keep them safe, but instead they threw a life raft down to try to escape for their lives. It was a crazy scene. Panic, chaos, fear, exhaustion, frustration, and just an all-around lack of hope. However, through it all, Paul remained a voice of reason. And because of his faith, because of his clarity, the crew wound up living to see another day. They made it to the island. They eventually made it to Italy. It is a crazy story, and it is crazy just like the storms in our life can be crazy and ridiculous. And we can learn so much about the storm from this story. And the first thing we need to know about the storm is this. The storm will bring clarity to what is most important to us. The storm, it'll bring clarity to what's most important to us. Like I said, we'll read a few pieces of Acts chapter 27. We'll start in verses 18 and 19, and it says this. We took such a violent battering from the storm that the next day they began to throw the cargo overboard. On the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. When neither the sun nor the stars appeared for many days, the storm continued raging we finally gave up all hope of being saved. When it comes to the storms of life, we can guarantee this. When life gets crazy and things get tough, our eyes will be opened to the things that are most important to us. When the sea got crazy, the people on this ship realized what was not essential and they started throwing it overboard. Our eyes will be opened to what's most important to us. And when we realize what's most important to us, two things happen. First, we realize what we need to hold on to. In the midst of family crisis, in the midst of health crisis, in the midst of financial crisis, in the midst of job crisis, we begin to realize the people and the things that are most important to us. And we hold on to those things. But the second thing that happens um, And this second thing can often add to the chaos of the storm. However, it's a necessary piece to form us into the people that God is trying to create us to be. Oftentimes in the storm, we realize what we have to let go of. We realize what we have to let go of. Often in the storm, what is revealed are the attitudes, the things, the people that we need to let go of in our life. We realize in the storm all of the non-essentials that are no longer serving us. And by no longer serving us, I mean no longer creating us into the people that God has called us to be. These things are holding us back. God has a plan. God has a purpose. God has a future for your life. And in the storm, you cannot forget that God didn't cause the storm. God did not cause the storm, but you better believe that God will use the storm to mold you and create you into the person that he wants you to be. God will not allow you to go through the storm in vain. God will bring some kind of good. He didn't cause the bad, but he will bring some kind of good out of it. He will call you to let go of some things, to create you into the person that you're meant to be. So what does that look like? In the storm, God may be asking you to let go of control. Maybe you are like me, and you are a very controlling person, and you need to know the outcomes. Not only do you need to know the outcomes, but you need to know, like, you know there's a hundred steps, and you need to know all hundred steps (laughs) right at the beginning, because you have to control everything. You have to control every step. Maybe in the storm, God is inviting you to just let go of control. He's inviting you to surrender. He's inviting you to trust him. He's inviting you to walk with him and trust that he is faithful and that he is good. Maybe in the storm, God is calling you to let go of unforgiveness. Maybe There are relationships 
that are broken. There are people in your life that you are separated from, that you've been holding on to unforgiveness. Maybe God is, is calling you to let go of unforgiveness and extend some forgiveness and grace. And I have to give a caveat on this one because sometimes there are relationships in your life and things that are broken and people that are just unsafe and that you should not have that relationship with them for your own safety. That is okay, but you can still extend forgiveness to those people. You can still extend grace to those people to free yourself to free yourself of bitterness, to free yourself of resentment. So maybe God is calling you to let go of unforgiveness. Maybe God's calling you to let go of an addiction or a vice. Likely, the storm you're in was caused by said addiction or vice. And God is going to use this storm to bring clarity to your mind, to open your eyes, to allow you to begin the process of letting that go. Or maybe God is calling you to let go of a relationship. There's somebody, there's a group of people in your life that you've known for a long time now that you need to let go of. They're no longer pushing you towards the more that God has for your life, and they're holding you back. Well, God might be inviting you to let go of that relationship. Use your time in the storm to get with God and ask him to reveal what you need to let go of. Use your time in the storm to throw some things overboard, to throw resentment overboard, to throw unforgiveness overboard, to throw these things out of your life because you were never meant to carry these things anyways. The storm gives you a gift. God gives you a gift in the storm, and it is the gift of clarity. And you need to leverage that gift to your advantage, to ask God to reveal to you what you need to say goodbye to. What obligations, what relationships, what habits do you need to release so that you can grab hold of the more that God has for your life? And I have to say, sometimes when we pray and we ask God to reveal to us the things that we need to let go of, there are some things that are going to be like really easy to let go of. You're like, all I needed was permission, and you just throw that thing off. Some things are super easy to let go of. However, most of the things in your life that God is going to call you to let go of will not be easy. They will be very difficult. It will take a process. It will not be a quick moment. It will be a series of a lot of small decisions. Sometimes God calls you to let go of things in your life, and you will need professional help to let go of them. You will need to see a therapist, and that is okay. Can I just say, I just think everyone should be in therapy because honestly, we are all messed up. We all got a lot of stuff going on. And it is totally okay to seek a professional who literally has had years and years and hundreds of hours of training to help us deal with this stuff. It is okay. Take that opportunity. Or maybe you need to be in a support group, in a recovery group. The good thing about all of this is that here at CityLine Church, we want to partner with you to help you get a hold of these things. Because we understand that letting go of the cargo and the things that are weighing us down in our life is a process. And so if that's you today, we would love to come alongside you. We would love to. We are not therapists. However, we can point you to some really good ones, and we'd love to do that. We have Celebrate Recovery. We have an opportunity. You can still jump in. You can still take that first step to letting go. And I invite you this week to, to do that to reach out, to send an email, to see how you can get connected with a therapist or get connected and celebrate recovery. Use these things because I believe that God has gifted therapists to do this work. I believe that God blesses ministries like Celebrate Recovery that are seeing people become free. And so use these things that God has placed in front of you so that you can let go. So you begin the process, and in the process, give yourself grace because it's going to take a long time, and that's okay. The second thing that we need to know about the storm is that we can prepare before the storm ever comes. We can prepare before the storm ever comes. Verses 22 through 26, it's Paul. He's talking to the crew kind of right in the middle of the storm, and he says this, but now I urge you, to keep up your courage, because not one of you will be lost. 
Only the ship will be destroyed. Last night, an angel of God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood beside me and said, do not be afraid. You must stand trial before Caesar and God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. So keep up your courage, men, for I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. Nevertheless, we must run aground on some island. Keep, keep courage, keep faith. There's a future, but nevertheless, there's going to be some destruction on the way, right? Like, he keeps it real for us. Paul says, so keep up your courage. I have faith in God that it will happen just like he told me. How in the world does Paul have that kind of faith in the middle of a crazy storm like this? Well, some of you might be saying, well, Megan, it says, it says in the verse that an angel of the Lord appeared to him and told him. So obviously, that's why he believes. I agree with you like a little bit. So I think that God used this angel to give Paul clear direction. And in life, we do need that clear direction. However, what we see in scripture, that there are many times in scripture when God speaks clearly. He speaks clearly through uh, prophets. He speaks clearly through people. He speaks clearly through angels. The Bible is crazy, you guys. God is speaking through animals and <laughs> objects. Like, you need to read this stuff. But, but God is speaking very clearly to people, but yet the next day the people still doubt him. They still doubt the message he sent. And I think that's kind of true for us in our own lives, right? Like, we, we hear a word from God maybe through, through a trusted friend, a trusted person who you know is walking with Jesus, or, or you, you know that God is speaking through you, giving you a promise, giving you an encouragement through maybe a scripture passage, and you're on this spiritual high, and you're like, yes, God can do it. And then you go to bed, and you wake up, and you're like, God cannot do it. <laughs> and you're doubting. So what's the difference about Paul? I believe that Paul was prepared for the storm before the storm ever came. Paul was prepared spiritually. He was prepared to trust God before anything terrible ever happened. Paul was somebody who regularly speaks about the faithfulness of God. Paul knows that God had been faithful to him in the past, and he will continue to be faithful to him now. Oftentimes, we don't just stumble upon a great faith like this. You will likely not wake up with just a great faith out of nowhere. <laughs> faith like that, faith like Paul had in this moment, came from an investment. It came from him investing in a relationship with Jesus. It came from Paul walking with Jesus in his daily life. It came from Paul fixating his focus, not on his surrounding, not on his imprisonment, not on the storm, but on the reality of who Jesus is long before the storm ever came. So when it comes to the storms of life, we need to invest. We need to invest in a relationship with Jesus and become storm ready. Last year, Austin and I got the opportunity to visit some family in Florida. And his uncle, he lives on the shore. And as you know, the year prior, they had experienced a devastating hurricane, Hurricane Harvey. And it hit Florida and that area extremely hard. And as we were driving, we were seeing homes that were destroyed. We were seeing docks that were destroyed. And, and we looked on kind of in horror, right? And we looked out our window and we saw a huge boat that was actually still washed up on shore, entangled in all kinds of craziness. Yet, as Austin's family is telling us the story about the storm, they're like very calm. They're like, yeah, so there was a, the hurricane, and it came, and, you know, we're okay now. And they're just very calm. They're telling us all the details, and Austin and I are like, oh, my gosh, we would totally be freaking out. We, like, are not used to weather. We are from Alaska, where there's one weather of snow, and we moved here because we don't like the snow, where there's no weather. So we are not used to weather at all. We would be totally freaking out and losing our minds, and his family's just kind of like, yeah, well, this is what happened, and then we did this, and then we did that. And you might be wondering why. How were they able to stay so calm in the midst of the storm and even calm retelling us the story of what was potentially a very traumatic event? It's because they are native to Florida. They have lived in Florida for a long time. In Florida, this is crazy. 
There are storm seasons. There are seasons for hurricanes. And so the people that live there, they built their homes in a way that could withstand a hurricane. As they watch the news and they hear about storms that are going to be rolling in, they don't just sit and, and go, oh, well, hope it doesn't hit us. You know, they get out of their house. They go out onto their lawn. They bring in the things that are going to break. They put it in their garage. They actually board up their house. They built their house in such a way that it would be easy to board up and easy to kind of lock themselves in and stay storm ready. They're storm ready. I think that in our spiritual lives, there are things that we can do to become storm ready. We can build our lives in such a way that when a storm hits, we are already prepared. And this is not to say that the storm won't affect you. This is not to say that the storm won't be scary. This is not to say that the storm won't cause some sort of devastation in your life. But if we invest time in a relationship with Jesus... By spending time in prayer, by spending time reading his words in the Bible, by spending time building community, when the storm of life hits, we will be able to be like Paul and say, I have faith in God. I have faith in God that it will happen just like he told me. Paul had this faith that God would do what God said he would do. And I believe he had that faith because he kept a record in his heart. He kept a record in his heart and a record in his mind of all of the ways in the past that God had been faithful, all of the ways in the past that God had worked and moved in his life. And he allowed that record to build up a trust in God, trusting that God is who he says he is and God can do what he says he's going to do. Maybe today you find yourself in the middle of the storm and you're like, well, I was not storm ready. And you're like, well, well, what about me? Well, just because you weren't storm ready before the storm doesn't mean you can't prepare even in the midst of the storm. So what I want to say to you is that in the midst of the storm, pause today, five minutes, just five minutes to do this exercise, to write down or type up in your phone, just think of all of the ways that God has come through for you. Think of all of the times that God has been faithful to you. Think of all of the times that he has used people and his presence to comfort you. Think of all of those times that he has brought peace to you. And just begin to keep a mental record of that. Begin to build your trust in God, even in the midst of the storm. Even right in the middle of the storm. Another part of preparing before the storm is is just being sensible just being sensible in the storm. And that brings us to our next point is simply this, to take care of yourself in the storm. Take care of yourself in the storm. In, in verses 33 through 34, as the storm is getting terrible, the crew, they're really a long way off from Rome. They are nowhere near their final destination. And, and Paul, he says these very profound words. He says, just before dawn, Paul urged them all to eat. For the last 14 days, he said, you have been in constant suspense and have gone without food. You haven't eaten anything. Now I urge you to take some food. You need it to survive. Not one of you will lose a single hair from his head. I love this part of the story because a lot of times what happens when the storms of life come? What's the first thing to go when life gets chaotic and crazy? It's that self-care. It's us taking care of the basic needs that we have. We're like, eat. Who has time to eat? I have appointments to get to. I have people to visit. I've got confrontations that I got to make. I got to intervene on somebody. I got to pray. I got to do this. I got to do that. I got to get here. I got to get there. And yes, you have to do all of those things. All of those things are an unfortunate part of the storm. But honestly, Paul gives us a reminder here that we can be totally in tune with what God is doing, but we cannot forget to take care of our basic needs. So often in the storms of life, we lose sleep. We forget to eat. We lose track of time. What I love about this is that it doesn't seem spiritual But it is. See, because Paul, he was a visionary man of God. This is the guy that wrote the Bible, yet he was so practical. Paul was sure that God could do what only God could do. 
but he was also sure that he had to do what only he could do. Taking some time to rest, taking some time to eat, taking some time to do those things is spiritual because you are partnering with God. You are saying, God, I trust you to do what only you can do, but Jesus, I need to eat a taco. I need to take care of myself. I need to take a nap. Maybe your storm is such that you literally cannot sleep through the night. People are calling you in the middle of the night and you've got to run and you've got to go and you're anxious and you're not sleeping well. I would encourage you, just take a nap. Take 10 minutes. If you can't sleep, just close your eyes. Close your eyes and allow your body to rest. Know that God can do what only God can do, but you need to do what only you can do and you need to eat. You need to rest. You need to sleep. I hope that you all have that friend that texts you or calls you or is just like, hey, like, I've noticed, and I just was, like, wondering if you've eaten today, (laughs) you know? I hope that you all have that friend. But if you don't, I also hope that you realize you have a phone. And there honestly have been times in my life when things have been so crazy and things have been so out of control and I am losing sleep and I am losing track of time that I honestly have to transfer my brain to my phone and set a reminder that says, Megan, you have to eat dinner. Megan, you have to eat lunch. And I would just, it's practical, but it's spiritual too. Partner with God to do what only you can do. These men on this ship were going to be no good sailors if they were hungry and tired. And honestly, in the storm, you're not going to be that great if you're hungry and tired because hanger is a real thing, you guys, and it makes us make bad choices. And a lot of times when we are tired and we are hungry, it just makes the storm feel worse. It amplifies the storm. So would you do this basic thing and just partner with God to realize that you need to take care of yourself? The next thing that we can learn from the storm is that we have to have support in the storm. We have to have support in the storm. Like I said, as the story gets crazier and crazier, soldiers were trying to lower down life rafts to escape from the ship. In verses 30 through 32, it says this, in an attempt to escape from the ship, the soldiers left the lifeboat down into the sea, pretending they were going to lower some anchors from the bow. Then Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, unless these men stay with the ship, we cannot be saved. So the soldiers cut the ropes that held the lifeboat and let it drift away. Paul is extremely in tune with the reality here that in the midst of this storm, they will not be able to make it out without the help of every single person on that ship. A lot of times in our lives, when storms hit, we tend to isolate ourselves. We tend to pull ourselves away. We tend to, in a sense, we're like these soldiers. We, we trickily lower our lifeboat down, get in, and just kind of drift away. We drift away from maybe the very people that God has placed around us to carry us through the storm. And we do this because of pride or, or shame or, or something like this. And we begin to separate ourselves from people. Well, this story is a reminder to us that in the storms of life, we actually need community. I want you to know, don't think that you can weather a storm alone. You cannot. You will not. You will not be able to do it because you were never meant to live alone. In fact, in Genesis, the first book of the Bible, it tells the story about the creation of the earth. And it says that God created the heavens and the earth and he created everything. He created the moon and the stars and the grass and the animals and all of the things in between all of that. And he said, this is good and this is good and this is good. After everything he created, he says, this is good. And then he creates man and he looks back and he's like, something not good about this. And so he creates woman, and in creating woman, together he created community. He created community. And so what that means for us is that since the beginning of scripture, we were always better together. We were always better together. We were always meant to live life together. And you might be thinking, can't God miraculously pull me out of the storm? 
to which I would say, absolutely. I would not doubt that God could do that for you. God is a God of miracles. However, what we see a lot of times in scripture and in our own lives is that the miracles of God come through the people of God around us. God uses people, God uses community to come alongside us, to pray with us, to carry us through a hard time. We'll never make it out of the storm alone. We have to be aware of God. We have to be aware of his community, of his people that he's placed around us. Don't lower your life raft. Don't lower your life raft and drift away. Stay connected. Get plugged in. Reach out. Look around. There are so many people in this room right now that would love nothing more than to weather life storms with you. They would love to pray with you. They would love to laugh with you. And then when the time comes, they would love to cry with you because they understand the importance of community. Don't push them away. And you know what? If you're here this morning and you're feeling isolated and you're feeling disconnected, my name is Megan Lemons and I'm the Community Life Pastor and I would love to get you plugged into any of the community groups that we have here. There are so many for you to get plugged into, for you to begin to build community with, for you to begin to have people that know you and you feel a sense of belonging and you feel a sense of trust where you can be vulnerable and you can share and you can know that these people are going to pray with you and they're going to cry with you and they're going to walk with you. Just just don't push them away. Just take that opportunity because the opportunity is here for you. You just have to choose. You have to choose to reach out. A lot of times, sometimes people will reach out to you and it'll be kind of by accident, but a lot of times it will just be you taking that courageous step to say, I want to be in community. I want to know people. I want people to know me. So don't, don't push people away and take advantage of that opportunity to, today. Paul's story, it teaches us so many great things about the storms of life. But the most important thing and the most important promise and the most important truth, and we've been talking about this for several weeks now, and we've said it in many different ways, that in the valley, in the waiting, in the land in between, and even in the storm, God is present. And that's our last point. Remember God's presence with you in the storm. Remember God's presence with you in the storm. I want to shift gears a little bit, and I want us to read uh, another storm story in scripture, and it's found in the book of Mark, in the gospel of Mark, and it's about Jesus and his disciples. It's Mark 4, verses 35 through 41, and it says this. That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. And the disciples woke him and said, Teacher, don't you even care if we drowned? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. I think of all of the stories about Jesus and his disciples, this is hands down my favorite story. And I love this story because it's just, it's raw, it's real, and it just shows us so much how God is always present with us in the storm. Here you have the disciples. They're serving alongside Jesus. They are hearing Jesus teach. They're hearing Jesus preach. They're seeing him perform miracles. They are obedient to Jesus. They're doing what Jesus has called them to do. And in this moment, Jesus has called them to go to the other side of the lake. So they listen because it's Jesus. And they're like, Jesus would never lead us astray. So the disciples, they're invited to cross the Sea of Galilee. And what we need to know about the Sea of Galilee is that it's actually quite prone to random storms just like this. It's because of its location, and it's because that it's a very shallow sea and the weather patterns during the day. However, it would have been very uncommon for this storm like this to hit at night because it had to do with the weather during the day. So much like storms in our own life, the storm that the disciples experienced here was totally unexpected. It totally caught them off guard. 
Well, the storm is raging, and the disciples are running around. They're freaking out, and they're like, where the heck is Jesus? And you're thinking the story just said he was, like, laying on the boat on a cushion. Well, yes, he was, but he was laying in the stern of the boat, meaning they couldn't actually see him because he was literally inside of the boat. So they're running around. They're screaming. They're like, where is Jesus? They find him. He is asleep, you guys. He is doing nothing. And so they are freaking out. In my mind, I don't know if this is how it happened but in my mind this is how it happened they wake up Jesus they take him by the shoulders and they're like Jesus do you even care if we drowned do you even care and I love this part of the story because like they're straight up rude to Jesus like this is disrespectful you know you would never like talk to a boss like that or somebody like that you know like they're rude they they they're just real though They're freaking out. They are afraid. They are scared. They are doubting and they are real. And what I love about this story is that Jesus can handle their realness. He can handle their rawness. He calls them out and likely they had a conversation afterwards. However, (laughs) he can handle it because he still loves them. He still calms the storm. I love this story, like I said, because it's this raw human emotion of them yelling out, Jesus, do you even care? And I know for me, I have had times in my life when I have been so mad, when I have been so frustrated, when I have been so done with the storm of my life that I look at God and I said, God, do you even care? God, are you still there? And I know many of us have as well. Well, in this story, Jesus gets up and he calms the storm and he poses a question to his disciples. He says, why are you afraid? To which any of us would say, Jesus, because we were literally about to die. Like the storm was crazy. It was about to break the boat. We were going to drown Jesus and we didn't see you doing anything. You were taking a nap. But Jesus finishes his question with this. He says, do you still have no faith? Do you still not realize who I am? Do you still doubt me? Drawing his disciples' attention to the fact that that God had been with them the whole time. Jesus was never going to let them drown. He was never going to leave them. What happened in this story was the disciples just forgot. They forgot who they were with. They forgot they were with Jesus. The storm distracted them. The storm distracted them, and they forgot that Jesus had been in the boat with them the whole time. They forgot who Jesus was. They forgot how much Jesus loved them. They forgot that since the beginning, Jesus chose them. They forgot that not just moments ago, Jesus had literally told them to go to the other side. And if Jesus calls you to go somewhere, he's going to walk with you through it all the way until you get where he called you to go. I hope that in the storm of life, you don't forget who you are with. I pray that in the storm, you remember that Jesus is close, that God is near. You may not see him, you may not feel him, but he is in the boat. Yes, the storm will be terrifying. Yes, it will cause some destruction in your life. Yes, you will have to be vulnerable and you will have to invest in building community with other people. Yes, you will have to let go of some things in your life. It will be hard, it will be difficult, but Jesus will be with you the whole time. He will be there. In the storms of life, when you are asking God, where are you? Do you even care? He is right next to you saying, I'm right here. I'm crying with you. I hurt with you. I know what's going on. I see what's happening and I hurt too. I'm with you. You can trust him. He will walk with you. He will work in and through you during the storm because he has been faithful before. And you can bet that he will be faithful now. Now, you may not get the outcomes that you want. You may not get the outcomes that you had been 
praying for, but you will have the promise of the presence of Jesus and the reality of his community around you. And though your circumstances and your situation may not change, God will change you and he will work in you and he will give you his comfort and he will give you his peace even in the middle of the storm. And so this week, I want us, the prayer that I want us to pray is simply this, God, would you make me aware? God, would you make me aware of your presence? Would you make me aware of what I need to let go of? Would you make me aware of the community? Would you make me aware of the hope that you promised me? Would you make me aware that you promised more for my life than what I'm experiencing right now? And the promise that I want us to proclaim this week is Joshua 1, 9. It says this, Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Be strong and courageous. Reach out to other people. Be vulnerable. Jump into community. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. The storm is a season. And it is what you are experiencing right now, but right now is not forever. The storm will pass. Just like the seasons in our own earth, you will make it through. The storm will calm. The season will change. Right now is not forever. Don't be discouraged. Don't give up. Don't lose hope in who you are with because he will see you through to the end. He will walk with you to the end. Do not be discouraged. It's just for right now. It's not for forever. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go, whether it's whether you're in the waiting, whether you're in the valley, or in the land between, or even in the storm today, you have to know that God will be with you wherever you go. You might not see him sometimes, you might not feel him sometimes, but you have to know that he is alive, he is active, he is moving, he is working on your behalf for your good. So be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged for the Lord, your God, will be with you wherever you go. Let's pray. God, we just thank you so much for today. God, we know that you are not the cause of the storms in our life. But God, we ask that even in impossibly horrible situations, Lord, would you please bring some sort of good? Father, I pray for those who are in the middle of a storm right now. Lord, would you give them comfort? Would you give them peace? Would you make them just aware of your presence? Allow them, God, to step into community, to share their burdens with other people, to not go through this alone. Father, for those who are not in a storm right now, God, just build their faith. Build their faith so that when a storm comes, Lord, that that they would trust in you, Jesus. That they would surrender to you. And for all of us, God, as a community, I pray that you would give us the bandwidth to come alongside one another, to pray with one another, to walk with one another, to be your hands and your feet in each other's lives. Father, we pray that we would see through to the end of the storm. Give us hope, give us courage to see your hand at work.